pristine nature, hidden landscapes, enchanting wilderness, all in the middle of Europe. Welcome to the Balkan Express, a journey of discovery through five young nations in southeastern Europe. A coastline with over a thousand islands and a green hinterland with unique natural spectacles. That's Croatia. We find out how father and son catch a thieving mongoose, get to see feeding time in the Bear Orphanage, and witness the extraordinary friendship between Stjepan and his stork Malina. In the north, the country rises over the Balkan Peninsula in a sweeping arc. A large part of Croatia lies along the Adriatic and is well known for its picturesque coastline and its idyllic scattered islands. We're going on a voyage of discovery into the Croatian hinterland and the least known of its captivating islands. Miljet lies to the south and is one of the most beautiful and forested islands. Here is our first stop. Green, tranquil and shrouded in myth, that is Mliet. Odysseus and the Apostle Paul are said to have been stranded on these shores. With its thick woods and rare biotopes, two thirds of this island is a national park and has been under protection since 1960. Mechanical engineer Ivor Sidishan lives with his family in the midst of the national park. We live in harmony with nature. We're surrounded by calm. You won't find the fast pace of the city here. Only our work makes us keep to a timetable. Other than that, time's of no importance here. Whether I'm at home or at work, I never wear a watch. Five-year-old Marin is already comfortable handling the fishing nets. The island locals live from the sea. Not many people inhabit Mliet. One of the reasons for this was its thriving population of venomous snakes. To combat these, mongoose were imported from India at the turn of the 20th century. The small predator successfully rid the island of the snakes, but there are now so many that it's the locals' chickens which are no longer safe. Only one egg again. We have to set him a trap, otherwise we'll have no more eggs. Good, then take this egg and we'll put it in the fish trap. Ivor usually uses this trap to catch lobster, but it also comes in handy to catch the swift little egg thief without hurting it. I would put it here. No, here. I'll put it here. The two symbols of the island of Mliet are the saltwater lakes, connected to the sea by a branch canal. The warm water, with few currents, provides perfect conditions for unusual biotopes and the rare stone coral that flourishes here. Mario Orlandini is a diving instructor and knows the waters around the island like no other. Hi. We heard a new stone coral colony was found. Can you check it out for us? No problem. It would be great if you could take some pictures and bring them round. Sure, I'll take some photos and a video. You have the location? The underwater world around the island forms part of the national park and is also protected. You can only dive here with special permission from the park authority. This is an exception, even for Mario. Only a healthy underwater environment allows the stone coral to thrive. 
This is one of the largest reefs in the Mediterranean and is of global importance. The rare coral forms in colonies which are up to two meters long and is continuing to spread as Mario is finding out. The piece above the water is still being disturbed. The little predator, the mongoose, is still at large. But even though he's an egg thief and will on occasion attack the chickens, the locals don't consider him a pest. It's a kind of symbiosis. The mongoose helps get rid of the venomous snakes. If they were to come back, he'd surely eat them all again. And we help him survive. He's become endemic. He's been living here for over a hundred years, longer than me. Although the mongoose is not a protected animal, people here refrain from killing it, choosing instead to set it free far out in the countryside. Ivo and Marin will bring him to the other side of the lake, from where he shouldn't be able to make it back to the village too easily. Ivo is proud of this little patch of the planet and feels a responsibility towards it. Humans are just a small part of the ecosystem here. There's only around 300 of us living in the whole park, so not many. Ever since humans have lived on the island, already a few hundred years now, we've barely made an impact on its wildlife. Mliet is a good example of how the preservation of nature, the everyday life of a local community, and even tourism can work together in harmony. As long as man sees nature as an ally, that must be both respected and protected. It's good that he can't swim, so he can't come back and will live here. We'll put the basket here and then let him out, OK? Look how he turns. When he attacks a snake, he turns a circle just like that. And at some point, when it can't follow him anymore, loses its balance and falls over. And that's when he pounces and eats it. And go, go. Oh, he's coming up. Bye. Oh, he didn't say goodbye. From Mliet, we take the ferry north. Our destination is Havar, the fourth largest island in Croatia. Due to its natural beauty and cultural riches, it's been a popular tourist destination for as long as anyone can remember. With its different species of birds, medieval towns and isolated coves, many consider it Croatia's most beautiful island. Whilst the tourists crowd the coastal town, the green hinterland is usually empty and peaceful. Many have left the remote villages in search of the money to be earned along the coast. Yet more and more young people are now returning, seeking its tranquility and affordable homes. Lucrezia Schwartz and her son Aaron have been living in Buzje for 10 years. They're jewelry designers and make their own creations, usually from red coral. They are part of a long tradition working with the precious material. Silver and coral look very good together. You can combine them. Coral is highly prized throughout the world, and we have it on our doorstep, so to speak. Aaron and Lucrezia mainly work with coral from the Adriatic. All around the islands of Mliet, Vis and Var, there are coral colonies at a depth of 100 meters. In comparison to stone, coral is much softer and easier to work with. Its intense red color has been much admired throughout history.
Coral used to be called red gold. It's valuable because it's hard to find. The coral population is in decline, and European and North African countries have a strict quota on how much you can gather per year. Scientists believe that with global warming, the coral will disappear. It's questionable for how much longer it will even exist. In many parts of the country, coral jewelry forms part of the traditional costume. Lucrezia and Aaron want to preserve this national heritage and make their own versions of the traditional jewelry. All are self-styled and painstakingly made by hand. Havar is the hotspot of the island with the same name. 500 years of Venetian rule have given the town its facade and its Italian flair. Before the holiday season, it's possible to enjoy the romantic town and beauty of the island in peace and quiet. Like almost everyone on the island, Aaron and Lucrezia make a living from tourism. Havar nightlife makes it very popular with the jet set and with celebrities from all over the world. The perfect clientele for their unusual jewelry. Anything that is handmade is hard work, and more and more people shy away from it. Sometimes I wonder if we should have done it like the others, buy jewellery in other countries and just resell it here. But that wouldn't make me happy. I couldn't imagine doing that. I have been living with this creativity for over 20 years. Our journey takes us deep into the blue Adriatic and to the island of Vis. Vis is the furthest populated island from the coastline. Seven kilometers long and eight kilometers wide, it's also one of the smallest. Vis has only two towns, but has countless secluded coves and beaches. For a long time, it served as a military base. It's only been open to tourism since 1995 and counts as an insider's tip. People, mainly fishermen and farmers, have been living on the island since the third century BC. 20 years ago, agriculture was still the main source of income for the islanders. Olives, wine and fruit from Vis was widely renowned for its quality. Fishing is still important, but many people have now given up farming. <laughs> Velimir Mratinic is breathing new agricultural life into the island. He returned after finishing his studies and has taken over his parents' farm. He soon realized that he'd need something special to allow farming to sustain his family. So, for the last 10 years, he's only been producing the fig bread, viskihid, a local delicacy made from dried figs, Mediterranean herbs and schnapps, made according to an old family recipe. For the desiccation, we pick fruits that are already half dried. You can see the figs start to dry on the tree. Those fruits are best for dried fruit. They give the best quality. They're as sweet as honey. That's the real quality. Mm -hmm. 
Velimir was the first to farm organically on the island. A further 15 small farmers are following his example. Sadly, though, in spite of Velimir's positive experience, many of the fields on the island still lie fallow. For me, it was always clear what I'd be doing one day. I loved farming and I still do. I make an effort so that my children like it too. I want to show them and others that the work is worth it. It's not just enjoyable, but also has to be profitable. Only then can you continue. Wild fennel has spread itself across the idle fields. Its aromatic seeds ensure the special scent of fig bread from Vis. The family help out on the field as often as possible. Vilimir and his wife, Vesmer, feel it's important for the children to get to know the work early and develop their appreciation of nature. Sometimes it's a help, but it's really so that they get an impression of what they have to do when they're older. We want to teach them working habits. And aside from that, every little helps. After a long day in the field, it's time to go back home. When Vies opened its doors to tourism, many of the islanders gave up farming. Some regret it. Tourism alone, especially as most of them are sailing tourists, doesn't offer enough income to support everyone on the island. The fig bread is prepared by hand in Velimir's home. The dried figs are ground and stirred to a sticky dough with the herbs and local spirit. We make the fig bread the old, traditional way. This is how people used to preserve figs for long periods of time. The tighter the consistency and the larger the individual cake, the longer the figs are dried out and the longer they can be enjoyed. The flat cakes are dried once again before they are wrapped in bay leaf and rosemary and sold to delicatessens all over Croatia. The hib used to be food for poor people as well as a delicacy at the tables of the rich. You ate the first hib of the year at Christmas and it lasted throughout the year. One would give it to guests and friends who came to visit. One would also give a small triangle for school lunch. Figs and hib are very nutritious and were an important source of energy for poor families in bad times. From Vis and the Adriatic coast, the train takes us further north. Our destination is Velebit. 145 kilometers in length, it is the largest mountain massif in the Dinaric Alps. A strip of wilderness has been preserved in this impressive mountain range and its nature left intact Velebit creates a natural climate barrier between the coastal region of the Adriatic and the hinterland. The slopes exposed to the sea are bare and barren, but those facing inland are green and soft. At the foot of northern Velebit National Park lies Kuterevo, a village with 600 inhabitants and an international volunteer camp.
Since 2005, young people from all over the world have been coming to Kuterevo. They want to explore the natural and cultural heritage site and help to preserve it. The camp run by international volunteers is a place of cultural exchange, learning and a sustainable lifestyle. The heart of the project, a refuge for bears, which also takes in orphaned bear cubs that would not have made it out in the wild alone. The founder and heart and soul of the project is Ivan Tsenkovic Pavinka, a social worker and nature lover. A new enclosure is being made for the bears, which the villagers are helping with. Although the bears are the focal point at Kuterevo, the volunteer program is much more than that. It's a project where you learn about nature, learning and finding out about how the wild and civilization can find a balance and exist alongside each other. It's our goal to honor this village, which lies remotely on the slopes of the Velebit and its way of life. To show the villagers that this is not just poverty and backwardness, but a simple and nowadays highly sought-after way of life. There are many bears in the forests around Kuterevo, but other wild animals, such as the wolf, lynx and wild boar have also carved out territory here. The simple and sustainable lifestyle, as well as close contact to nature, is what the young people want to learn about and protect in Kuterevo. Many volunteers come for a few months, whilst others, like Amélie Jacquet, stay for a few years. The young French woman has been Ivan's right-hand man for three years. She coordinates the self-run volunteer camp and makes sure everything goes smoothly. One of the main tasks for the volunteers, and their chief pleasure, is feeding the bears, a skill in itself. We scatter the food in a circle, otherwise the fat one would just take everything. The females would only get a bit, and the little ones would get nothing. So we spread it in large distances, so that everyone gets his portion, and they have to look for it for a little bit. The volunteer work is vital for the bear refuge, given that it's financed only by donations. Eleven bears live in Kuterevo at the moment, and all were orphaned as cubs. They were either too weak or too used to humans to survive in the wild by themselves. Even though they seem cute and have grown up with humans, they are wild animals and the fence is necessary. They can no longer be returned to the wild and hunt. The volunteers try to make their lives as comfortable and natural as possible. Further east, the foothills of the Velebit merge into the green meadows through which the river Gaka flows. A landscape of incredible beauty that is, at its most stunning, in Plitvice Lakes National Park. Sixteen lakes flow into the thickly wooded landscape. As the water makes its way, it creates an array of cascading waterfalls. Its uniqueness has ensured Croatia's oldest national park was also one of the first places listed as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. In the 1960s, the Plitavica Lakes became well known as the breathtaking backdrop to the Veneto films. Every year, over a million visitors come to admire this natural phenomenon.
People here have always lived with and from the water. The gushing of the watermill is only drowned out by the roaring waterfall. Nowadays, most of the mills have been closed down, and the village mill in Koarna is one of the few that's still going. Shlatko Shkoliaric has been running it for 15 years. For a small fee, he grinds the grain the villagers bring to him. It may be a little old-fashioned, but his services are in high demand, and with good reason. It smells so good because it's carefully ground with the water power. It doesn't burn, so the flour retains all its smell and taste. The electric mills are much quicker, but the flour doesn't have the same aroma as the flour that I grind. From the Plitvica lakes, we travel eastwards. Our next destination is Posavina, the valley of the river Sava, with its picturesque wooden houses and unique floodplain. The Sava is the largest river in Croatia and is the largest feeder river of the Danube. Its source lies in the Julian Alps, flows through Slovenia, Croatia and Bosnia until it empties into the Danube in Serbia's Belgrade. Along its banks are woodlands and vast floodplains, a wetland paradise for birds and other animals. People here have learned to live with the flooding. These wooden houses are built without nails, so they can be quickly taken down and reassembled on drier land. Many stand empty and are falling into a state of disrepair. Villages are being abandoned, and on the banks of the Sava, time seems to have stood still. Anton and Nada Dilas moved here because of the water. They're both anglers, and have been part of the national team in many international competitions. Now they're enjoying their retirement and being able to fish right on their doorstep. The Sava is a blessing for the people in this village and they've long known how to make use of the river, even when it rises and floods. That's the best time for catching fish or transporting wood. There are forests on the other side. Here, no one is scared of the Sava. People have grown together with the river. It's like their assistant, and the water is part of their life. The heart of the Sava floodplains is Loinskopolje, a pasture countryside that is completely flooded by the Sava several times a year. Its diverse wetlands are a natural paradise that is unique in the whole of Europe. The vast moorland is covered with original oak woods. A large part of the area is flooded for half of the year. In springtime, the receding water transforms it into luscious green and fertile land. The areas are used as grazing pasture for pigs, cows and horses. These pigs spend the whole year in the forest, feeding off roots, worms, fish and grass. To ensure they don't run wild, their owner comes to check on them every day. In the springtime, 
When the sows have their piglets and the grass isn't that high, he also feeds them a little. The horses spend the winter in the stables. In springtime, Miodrag Begovic brings them to the Loin Skopolje. They are Posavina horses, and their broad hooves prevent them from sinking into the swampy ground. A tough and strong breed, the Posavinas were used to pull Viennese trams. As that work is no longer needed, the breed is threatened with extinction, and now only a few hundred are still being kept. Here, they live in complete freedom for half the year. This is best for them. When these horses are no more, this will no longer be a field. It will be grown over with reeds and shrubs. The number of horses, cattle and other animals is declining. See how happy they are? They're happiest here. It's good in the stables, they have everything they need there. But freedom is best. Loin Skopolje's biggest attraction are the storks. The large birds have been living alongside the villagers peacefully for years and are nesting so prolifically that some villagers have more storks than people. Probably the most extraordinary story in all of Croatia. Malena and Klepetan, a stork couple together for 17 years and living with Stjepan Vokic. It's breeding season and they're expecting five young this year. Malena was shot many years ago and can no longer fly. Stjepan Vokic took her in and has been caring for her for 20 years. Without him, Malena would have died many years ago. I help them to survive. They wouldn't be able to feed their five young by themselves. So I help out. In this small aquarium, I always have fresh fish for them. Stepan drives up to 50 kilometers a day to catch the right fish for his storks. The majority of his modest pension is spent on caring for the birds. If it weren't for small donations from other animal lovers, he'd probably be going hungry himself, whilst making sure his storks were well fed. Stjepan cares for the two with tender love and care, and has been completely accepted by the wild animals. And soon the little one gets something to eat. In a week, the chicks will be making their first attempts to fly and then make their way to Africa alongside their father at the end of August. Malina stays at home with Stjepan. When Klepetan's gone, she's always with me. She has her room in the garage, which I heat for her in winter because she gets cold and shivers. Sometimes she joins me in the living room. We watch bird programs together on TV. I try to make sure she has a bit of variety as she doesn't want to go outside and shouldn't sit in a closed room by herself all day. The final destination of our Balkan Express journey is the breadbasket of Croatia, where tradition still plays out in the marshland of Kopatskirit, an array of natural diversity. This fertile region in the Panonina Basin is the Croatian province of Slavonia, an undulating landscape with rivers, water meadows, and harvest fields. 
The region is well known for its good wine and has been called home by many different Europeans for as long as anyone can remember. In no other region of Croatia can such cultural diversity be found. This is where traditions are preserved and interwoven. In Slavonia, elaborate hairstyles are a part of the national costume. Plaits made from up to 250 strands, true hair masterpieces. So that the technique is not forgotten, it is practiced often and all stages are carefully documented down to the very last strand. Blanka Jakula studies these old traditions. Many styles have historic meaning and have served as more than just decor for the traditional costume. The way a plant was bound would show what status the woman had in the community and what age she was. From the different styles, you could ascertain local, regional and religious affiliation. With old photos and the help of grandmother Mara, Blanka and Kaja reconstruct the style the girls wore in Gradište village a hundred years ago. The plant could have been higher. We know that, but is the hair at the front okay? Oh. Much too hot. <laughs> the historic styles require historic tools that aren't popular with everyone. Does it hurt? Blow. Blanka Jakula has been reconstructing and documenting ethnic hairstyles from all over Croatia for 20 years. Thanks to her, this unique cultural custom has been saved from obsolescence. The highlight is the floral decoration. In the summer, flowers from the garden are used, and in winter, silk flowers, old coins and small mirrors. Grandmother Mara confides in Blanca and Kaya, revealing her old tricks and judging their efforts. Five hours later, the masterpiece is complete and a further style is documented for generations to come. Nicolina, are you happy? Would you do it again? Which one of your friends would want it? None of them. Kopac Kirit lies on the border region of Hungary and Serbia and is one of the most important marshlands in Europe. These habitats are created by two lakes that are linked with the Danube and Drava rivers by canals. In this, the last wild segment of the Danube, over 2,000 species of animal flourish. The unimaginable wealth of fish here attracts countless birds. 298 different types have been discovered so far and 141 nest and breed here. And the king of them all is the white-tailed eagle. Due to its diversity, wildlife conservationists refer to Kopachkirit as Europe's Amazon. The natural park is strictly controlled. One of the most important tasks for the park ranger is the protection and monitoring of the white-tailed eagle population, which is one of the largest in Europe. Vladko Rojats is a biologist and has been running the white-tailed eagle monitoring program for 10 years. The Aries are hard to get to. On the whole, the landscape looks nice. You can see the nests up there. You think they're easy to reach, but that's often not the case. It depends on the water level. Sometimes we can't reach the Aries by boat or on foot. It's breeding season. Vladko and his colleague Boris have to find all the documented Aries. They're seeing whether the nests are still being used, and if so, how many young have hatched. They've already checked 49 and have 10 to go. 
And those are only the nests they know about. How large the white-tailed eagle population is really, no one accurately knows. It's difficult to approach the shy, quiet birds, as they prefer to build their eyries in high up and inaccessible areas. Both eaglets have just flown out. That was surely their first flight. Do you mean that's a new airy? Yes, yes. Despite the exact coordinates and markings on the trees, the search for an airy can take several hours. Large parts of this fascinating floodplain are closed to the public, ensuring the birds get the necessary peace and quiet they need. The white-tailed eagle is especially sensitive during the mating, breeding, and rearing seasons. Forty years ago, due to the devastating effects of the insecticide DDT, Kopachkirit was considered dead. The poison was banned and the areas fiercely protected. And since then, populations here have multiplied fivefold. But the majestic bird is still considered as endangered. What we want for the future is that everything stays as it is now. It's good for the eagles. And as eagles are good environmental indicators, it also means that the habitat is in good condition. We know that when we're protecting the eagles, we're protecting the entire biotope. Between marshes and fields, ocean worlds and wild mountains, Croatia is a country of breathtaking natural beauty in which both man and beast can find space to live. <laughs>